Hi everyone, I'm Mia Cobb from the Animal Welfare Science Centre at the University of Melbourne in Australia. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou kato. Greetings, greetings, greetings to you all. I'm Kat Littlewood from the Animal Welfare Science and Bioethics Centre located within Tapara Ora School of Veterinary Science at Massey University in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Welcome to our third and final day of this regional event hosted by the University's Federation for Animal Welfare. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands from which you are joining us today. I'm joining from the lands of the Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nations near Melbourne. And I would like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and extend that welcome to any First Nations people joining us today. U4 is an independent registered charity that works with animal welfare science or the animal welfare science community worldwide to develop and promote improvements in the welfare of animals through scientific and educational activity. Although situated in the UK, U4 are increasingly involved in efforts to support and promote the advancement of animal welfare and animal welfare science around the world and have become recognised as the International Animal Welfare Science Society. Membership and donations, no matter how small, help support the work of U4, which includes hosting events like this one. We are excited and so grateful to have U4 provide us a platform over these three days to feature scientific research and applications within the field of animal welfare from the Indo-Pacific Asia region. This has been a first for U4, but we hope it won't be the last. U4 also offer many opportunities such as various size grants to conduct animal welfare focused research, travel awards, student scholarships and awards for early career researchers. You can check out all of these opportunities along with the full program and abstract booklet on the U4 website which we'll include a link to in the chat box shortly. For everyone who has tuned into this event, there will be a certificate of attendance forwarded to you after the event. Don't forget this is an opportunity to build your network and identify new people that you might like to collaborate with. It's easy to send a quick email to any of the speakers you hear from today to connect with them and start a conversation. Absolutely. I've had the great privilege to collaborate with Kat this year for the first time writing together on a paper and it's wonderful to schedule regular times in our overlapping time zones to catch up. Another idea that can work well is to schedule collaborative working or writing sessions where you can work together in a Zoom room alongside each other. I've been doing this with another researcher in my time zone who's based interstate and although we aren't currently working on a project together, we do work alongside each other which keeps us both accountable and is very collaborative. We have shut up and write sessions, then share a coffee break together, bouncing ideas off each other. With so many people still working remotely at least part of the time, it's good to note that technologies and events such as this one offer up new ways to connect. For those of you just joining us today, and for those of you that are joining us again, just a reminder that we take questions through the question box that you'll see there. Um, and for those of you joining us on the staff side, so our attendees and panellists, we welcome you to enter your questions in the chat box and we'll be monitoring those as well. And for those social media gurus amongst us, the event hashtag is hashtag U4 2022 um, if you are sharing any posts on social media platforms. We've been live tweeting about each talk on Twitter and we'd love you to join us in having that conversation together. We might just take a couple of minutes break and then we'll come back and start our first session together. Take this opportunity to grab a drink, go to the bathroom quickly, stretch your legs before we settle in for our first session, which I think is the one I'm most looking forward to out of our whole program. We'll see you again in just a moment.
kia well, it's time to start into our first session of the day, session eight of the whole workshop, How Can We Afford Animals Moral Standing? It's my absolute pleasure to introduce our session chair, Dr. Mike King from the University of Otago in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Thanks very much, Kat. Well, it's lovely to be here and it's wonderful to be part of uh, such a fantastic conference. So, in this session, we're going to be engaging um, explicitly with some ethical thinking, um, which is obviously a key part of thinking about the welfare of animals. But it takes a step beyond just the welfare of animals to thinking about what we owe to animals, and that can have particular bearing on what we owe to them in terms of benefits and harms. So we've got three speakers that um, are, all, are all terrifically suited to talking on this subject. We have our first speaker who I'll introduce now, who is Dr. Jordan Hampton. Jordan is McKenzie Fellow uh, in Veterinary Clinical Sciences at the University of Melbourne. And his research it, um, focuses particularly on wild animal management, toxicology, public health and ethics, and animal welfare. And mainly on free living animals, um, those animals that are invasive, harvested and overabundant species. His current project focuses on uh, the threat posed by lead exposure from ammunition for wild animals, people and the environment in Australia. He's going to be speaking about um, how we consider the welfare of animals in this context with particular view to uh, one health I guess. So over to Jordan. Hi everyone, I'm Jordan Hampton from the University of Melbourne and I'm giving this brief talk on wildlife welfare and specifically uh, challenges associated with managing animal welfare when it comes to introduced wildlife species in Australasia. Uh, so this talk is conceptual in nature. I'm going to pose some questions to you all rather than presenting any original data. Um, and I'd really like to focus on what have been some of the most persistent um, and contentious animal welfare issues in our neck of the woods or our part of the world, and um, those relating to the control or killing, culling of unwanted wildlife species. Um, I'm going to refer to some specific examples from Australia and New Zealand that are um, contentious currently to try and illustrate some of the key points. So I'll talk about rodents in New Zealand in the context of programs like Predator Free New Zealand and feral horses in Australia, which have been a long term, long term source of contention in the southeast of the country. And Joe, just a, a few words on the, the history of thinking about animal welfare in a wildlife management context. I think um, optimistically, some of the early discussions around where these two fields intersect hope that uh, a win win situation would arise where animal welfare and conservation or biodiversity management were really uh, complementary ideas with not a lot of uh, necessary friction involved or, or need for trade-offs or conflict. Um, and in some cases, when we're talking about different groups of native species, um, that idea works quite well. But unfortunately, uh, once introduced species enter the, enter the fray, things get difficult. And um, you can see from some of the language that's used commonly in the media from these two snippets here, one program from Australia and one from New Zealand, um, there's very much an antagonism there towards introduced species and the use of military language suggested that a, a war is needed or, or mass killing of one group of animals is needed to protect the other or to um, optimise the, the well-being or resilience of the other group. So we definitely have a current situation where we don't seem to have a win-win situation whereby native and introduced wildlife species can, can coexist happily and that creates problems. When I talk about introduced species, I'm really just talking about vertebrate animals in this talk, but can be invertebrates too. Um, species that have been anthropogenically introduced to new land masses. Um, so really animals that have been moved around by people, whether they're true domesticated species uh, like cats and dogs or wild animals that have been released in, in new areas. So uh, we'll talk mostly about mammals here, but equally applies to, to birds, to fish, to amphibians, to reptiles as well. And traditionally, uh, especially in Australasia, 
unwanted introduced animals are managed through killing. Um, a number of different terms can be used, but um, ultimately this amounts to trying to reduce the abundance of uh, wild species that are seen to have de detrimental impacts, whether those impacts are felt by native species, uh, by humans who are inconvenienced, by agricultural producers, or, or even public health values in the case of some infectious diseases. Um, so fertility control is, is increasingly being spoke of optimistically as a method that might allow uh, population reduction of introduced species without the need for killing. But up to today and probably into the near future, we've relied very heavily on lethal control. And the welfare impacts of um, how we intentionally kill wildlife species have been relatively well studied. Uh, given that animal welfare science hasn't really been applied to wildlife species um, extensively when we compare it to domestic contexts, a lot of the studies that have been done have looked at things like shooting, which is used quite a bit for large mammal species and the use of uh, traps or, or poisons uh, for smaller species. And so a lot of the animal welfare science that we've done in this space has involved um, assessing, ranking, comparing, different methods that are intentionally used uh, to directly kill uh, these unwanted wildlife species through uh, approaches such as this uh, five domains assessment. But that's not the whole picture. What about the animal welfare impacts that are felt by the native species um, that are preyed upon, displaced or competed with by these introduced animals? This is where things get disgusting, as you can tell from these photos, but also interesting whereby we don't just have one group of animals we need to think about. Um, these photos are from um, offshore islands where seabirds nest and, and invasive rodents have been released and um, the rodents feed uh, on live um, ticks of seabird species that, that lack anti-predator um, adaptations. And you can see that the animal welfare impacts of being eaten alive or nibbled on alive would be um, pretty extreme by any uh, definition. We also have animal welfare impacts uh, exerted by wild herbivores or omnivores against native species through uh, extensive grazing or browsing and the loss of understory or habitat needed. Um, this article here looked at the impact of grazers in Australia on um, some species of grassland lizards. Um, and have erosion and, and eutrophication of waterways as well when we have uh, very high degrees of um, herbivore pressure on in ecosystems. And then there are also the welfare impacts on the introduced species themselves if no management actions are undertaken and their populations reach such high levels that mass mortality events occur, um, such as this photo depicts during a drought in Australia. And this has happened um, quite commonly in the last five years, particularly with feral horses, where there's been a, a hands-off attitude in Australia, arising largely from contention between different sectors of our uh, community. Uh, but yeah, I ultimately ended up with quite a few of these mass mortality events where um, animals have presumably uh, perished quite slowly when either water has been um, used up or, or forage has run out during very dry conditions. So there are, un there are unavoidably trade-offs involved uh, when we have native and introduced species inhabiting the same ecosystems. Um, and I would say in Australasia, it's almost impossible to maximise the welfare of one group without harming the other. So what can we do? Um, there's a few key questions to answer, some which relate to science and some which are ethical in nature. But when we think about the welfare of, of different groups involved in these situations, how do we uh, equally weigh um, asymmetrical comparisons such as thinking about the welfare of native versus introduced animals. Should our the definitions be different there? Uh, if we compare mammals versus non-mammals, should we think about the welfare of a horse equally as the welfare of a, a tiny frog, such as the species shown here, which is a corroboree frog from the Australian alpine areas? And should we think about a somewhat natural process such as predation in the same way as we think about an intentional process like the distribution of poison baits? This all gets complex very quickly, and this diagram isn't meant to represent anything except an impossibly complex scenario. And I think because traditionally we've thought about animal welfare 
mostly in the context of laboratory animals, livestock, pets. Uh, we haven't really needed to get into the holistic analysis of thinking of all these indirect and unintentional processes and um, how they can you know, interact with each other. Um, so something I'm going to suggest today is that one field of um, scientific inquiry has really gone into the holistic analysis space in the last 10 years especially, and that's One Health, or looking at human health concerns from a much bigger, broader, more environmental context. I'm sure everyone's heard of One Health, but it's quite a neat idea that really separates a modern holistic way of looking at different threats to human health and the environment and other species that we live with that differentiates it from very anthropocentric um, approaches in the past that really considered human medicine to be one field alone from veterinary medicine, zoology, ecology, et cetera. Um, now seeing the interactions that, that can't be avoided between those different areas, and that's leading to a much more holistic approach to health outcomes. So perhaps we can learn something from that and apply it to these very difficult wildlife dilemmas. Um, I've come across the idea of, of harm reduction reading some of the modern One Health literature. And this is quite a, an interesting idea that originated in the space of um, recreational or illicit drug use amongst human communities. But the idea refers to an approach that aims to minimise harmful outcomes, regardless of um, intentions or the following of rules. So some steps have been taken to unite animal welfare concepts with um, harm reduction approaches in North America. Um, and conveniently, some of the concepts and languages used by harm reduction models in One Health are the same terms that we use in at least one animal welfare model, and that's uh, the harms model. If you haven't come across the harms model, it's a very neat and simple conceptual um, idea developed by uh, Fraser and McRae um, over 10 years ago that splits all the anthropogenic ways that we can negatively impact on animals into four different groups that uh, progressively range from those things that we do directly and intentionally to those that are neither direct or intentional. So thinking about ecological disturbances and environmental effects, such as predation um, that occurs when we release animals into new land areas and some of the um, subtle and not necessarily predictable effects of herbivores impacting on habitat or survivorship of other species that inhabit their environments. So when we think about this broadly, there are animal welfare costs to controlling introduced animals, certainly. Anytime we're going to use uh, poison baits, traps, guns, we're going to harm animals. But there's also these animal welfare costs that we don't understand so well um, for the animals that share ecosystems with our introduced species. And there's animal welfare costs um, incurred if we don't do anything. This means unavoidable. We have to think about some difficult ethical decisions here. Um, so I've included the figure here of the classic trolley problem that's used to illustrate difficult decisions when it comes to trying to maximise outcomes where necessarily we have to create harm um, to a lesser degree to try and avoid harm occurring at a, at a larger scale. And then, of course, we also have other values involved with managing wildlife. Animal welfare isn't the only thing that uh, we need to think about. We have biodiversity outcomes. We have human utility. So it does become quite a complex um, series of decisions that need to be made. My suggestion for the future that I think would be helpful trying to navigate some of these difficult situations is to come up with an explicit model where we try and define the various harms and benefits in these situations and we don't restrict our thinking to our historical animal welfare ideas of just those intentional um, actions that we take. Um, we need to also think about these indirect processes that are happening and that um, profoundly affect the welfare of a large number of animals. So I think the One Health harm reduction model could be a good starting point there to allow some explicit consideration of all these different anthropogenic processes happening um, to try and guide decision making in the future to make it a bit easier for wildlife management managers to come up with um, with policies that work for the largest number of animals and that can be clearly explained to all of their various stakeholders. And I will quickly make the point that our ideas of wildlife, um, what's good, what's bad, what's wanted and unwanted are changing really rapidly. Um, especially in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of evolution of ideas in wildlife management 
um, often away from historical paradigms like sustainable use towards ideas like compassionate conservation. And even the concept of introduced species being bad or unwanted is increasingly being challenged. So we might find that we have an even more nuanced conversation in the future if we start thinking about some of these introduced animals as having a, a moral equivalence or um, equal degree of desirability to some of our native animals. So all I could say there is watch this space. I'm sure that there will be uh, more developments. So my final thoughts here would be that um, we have to recognise that we're going to harm wildlife um, in any of these situations where we have native and, and introduced species coexisting. Um, no matter what decision is made, some animals will be harmed. And the big question for us is how we prioritise these harms. We need to decide which animals we're comfortable with harming, how many of them, um, and by who. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, hopefully that's been a bit of food for thought when it comes to uh, some of the future dilemmas facing us in the Anthropocene when it comes to the welfare of our wild animals. Thanks to my collaborators uh, at the University of Melbourne. Okay, well, thanks very much for that, Jordan. So our next talk is uh, Dr. Michael Filler. Michael is from Massey, which is where I did my PhD. And so it's, it's wonderful to have, have him here and, uh, and as a fellow New Zealander as, as, as well. So Michael is going to be speaking about, oh, sorry, Michael is a senior lecturer from the School of Psychology at Massey University. So there he's director of the Social Cognition Lab and he does research into the areas of social cognition, social psychology and social neuroscience. And these are ideas that have huge relevance for understanding animal welfare and also um, moral psychology. And he's going to be speaking about the moral consequences of perceiving animal minds and his focus will be on uh, population management for euthanasia, which obviously has has huge implications for animal welfare, as well as the welfare of the people who are doing it, uh, who are often making very tricky decisions. So thanks, Michael. Thank you for coming you along for to, coming today's today's to today's workshop. workshop. My name is Michael Phillip. I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Psychology at Massey University. In this talk, I'll introduce a newer program of research I've been working on past couple of years and highlight the details of a pair of studies that illustrate some of the welfare related affordances associated with perceiving minds and animals. Each of us have direct access to only one mind, our own, but we attribute minds to a large variety of entities, whether people, animals, objects, even imagined beings. We do so quickly and automatically, hence the term mind perception. The question of which entities possess a mind is one we're going to leave to the philosophers but we know that some entities are pseudo-minds that exist only in our perception. Yet others are very clearly crypto-minds, minds that exist, that are no doubt there, but the content of which is inaccessible to us. Nonetheless, psychological evidence is quite clear that there are consequences to perceiving mind in other entities. For example, perceiving a mind is a necessary step for interacting with an entity. Where no mind is perceived, we merely act on it or toward it. We also must perceive the mind before we can begin to infer other entities' mental states. So it's quite obvious that perceiving a mind is a critical first step for assessing welfare. There are varied causes and consequences to mind perception that emerge when considering the affordances of mind perception. For example, we're arguably motivated to perceive animals' mental capabilities so that we can actually judge the welfare consideration we give or don't give to them. That motivation for not just social connection, but for better understanding and control motivates us to perceive minds. By being perceived to have a mind, an entity is bestowed moral status, and this in turn creates moral responsibilities in the perceiver. It's here that the affordances of mind perception become clear. By perceiving a mind, we come to feel responsibilities to the entity that demands moral consideration. Hopefully this inverse is similarly obvious. If we don't perceive a mind in an entity, we deny mind, no moral considerations are necessary or at least the considerations are reduced. 
current theoretical perspectives suggest that minds are not perceived as unitary constructs. Rather, when asked about the capabilities of diverse entities, people tend to perceive regular constellations of mental capabilities. Typically, these capabilities can be boiled down to two facets or dimensions of mind. Abilities related to subjective states like joy and fear, we typically talk about as experience or affect. Abilities related to planning and goal-directed action typically get talked about as agency or in an intentionality dimension. Gray Gray and Wegner's 2007 science paper provides probably the most popular demonstration of this two dimensions of mind perception. Across 2,000 participants, 13 characters were rated, each one based on uh, 18 mental capabilities. They found, as many have since, that the various mental capabilities distill down to do these two dimensions, experience and agency. In this framework, we see that people tend to perceive, for example, babies and dogs as highly capable of feeling subjective states, but less ability to plan actions independently and intentionally. Robots, conversely, are rated as more capable of independent action, but largely incapable of feeling subjective states like pleasure and pain. Interestingly, this model maps conveniently onto notions of patiency and agency from moral philosophy. Entities more capable of experience we consider as moral patients. Moral patients can have moral and immoral things done to them. Entities more capable of agency we consider as moral agents. Moral agents are capable of doing more and less moral things to others. With this in mind, we start to appreciate that perceiving a particular quality of mind informs the moral consideration we give to it. By perceiving a mind and entity, we are guided as to how the entity can be interacted with, especially with respect to moral considerations. In particular, my overarching thesis here is that the perception of mental capabilities guides the moral consideration we give to other entities. Research in a variety of disciplines have investigated this phenomenon. Probably most interesting to us in this context is human-animal interaction work. I'll just talk about a couple of studies here that illustrate some of what's been done. Um, Higgs et al. looked at people's attitudes towards different kinds of use of animals, different contexts, and how it related to beliefs in those animals' mental capabilities. Although this talk gets talked about as belief in the animal minds, the questions themselves look very much like typical mind perception questions. And across multiple domains of use, basic research, medical research, food, and pest control, the authors found that acceptance of um, the animal use was strongly related to perceptions of animal mind. Here we see along the vertical axis, the acceptability of animals in basic research, for example, but the pattern was the same across these different uses. And across the horizontal axis, we see these belief in animal mind um, ratings. And we see for animals low, uh, in that belief in animal mind, so frogs, fish, pigeons, chickens, etc., we see acceptability is higher for their use in basic research than for animals perceived as having um, more mind, being having having stronger mental capabilities. The idea that mind affords moral consideration around eating animals is also nicely reflected in Bastian et al.'s "Don't Mind Meat" studies. Across three studies, they make a strong case that mind perception is dynamic and changes according to contextual cues of what purpose an animal may serve us. So we don't just, it's not just that the use influences mind perception, but mind perception influences use. A very clear representation of their findings across both the correlational study, this finding, and two experimental studies is that we deny mind to the animals that we more often eat. And the animals we don't eat tend to be stowed um, more, they tend to be perceived as having greater mental capability. Most work examining my animal mind perception has examined animal use for human use, that is, eating and research, or companion animals, cats and dogs. Little work, though, has examined how mind perception interacts with conservation efforts, whether in zoos or wildlife settings. Among the most controversial, pragmatic, and seemingly ironic practices of conservationists is the killing of animals in order to protect the welfare of wider species. Most euphemistically, this is referred to as population management euthanasia. Broadly, the killing of any animal sits in a very hazy moral space for many people. In the best case scenario, even if the animal does not suffer, any agency or self-determination is taken away. On the other hand, such efforts are often taken when the risk to the wider population risk is perceived at risk. 
There's some work examining what factors influence professionals' acceptability of population management in Indonesia. For example, Power in 2016 looked at zoo workers' acceptance of population management in Indonesia in a conservation setting. In a pattern that perhaps surprises very few of us, they found the acceptability of euthanasia was rated lowest for large charismatic mammals, and acceptability was higher among recti reptiles, amphibians, fish, and invertebrates. So briefly, in our two studies, we sought to examine how the different dimensions or facets of mind are related to different moral considerations. We're also interested in understanding lay people's attitudes toward the use of population management in euthanasia and how different facets of mind perception inform those attitudes. So this led to this overall research question of how is, what aspects of mind perception predict acceptance of population management in euthanasia. I'll go through these hypotheses rather briefly, but effectively what we sought to do um, in hypothesis one and two of this first study is just kind of replicate um, this pattern of scores to see if we could replicate the pattern of scores um, found by Gray et al. in 2007 and the um, acceptability of uh, use of euthanasia. Uh, as found among the zoo workers, and we see this among lay people. And then we were also looking then at the acceptability of euthanizing animals, and is that's associated with um, these, th these facets of mind perception. We analyzed data from 80 participants via an online sample. They were first uh, introduced to uh, 10 characters, and each character had an emoji next to it and um, a brief description, as you see here. It involved three animal characters, six, uh, sorry, three human animals, six animals animals and one tree. They then rated nine capabilities of the 10 characters. As a side note on the next slide, I'll briefly summarize another program of research that uh, looks into the measurement. The takeaway idea is that when we specifically examine how people perceive animal minds, these eight bolded capabilities cluster into three facets or dimensions, not the two dimensions that have been found in pre prior research. Here we see those three dimensions of mind perception Agency experience are most similar to what we've seen before, but we also find a foundational dimension. For now, I'll explain the foundational dimensions, mostly just the mental qualities that vary least among animals. It's uncommon for, to perceive animals as lacking hunger and fear, for example. Although we measured intelligence too, we don't consider it a mental capability per se. We're just going to control for it. We'll come back to it later. So participants rated um, for each of these uh, characters, 10 characters, they rated them on these capabilities. And then um, for the animals and the tree, they rated um, the acceptability of euthanizing that animal uh, for population management reasons. What we found was something that, um, in terms of mind perception space, these facets, a pattern that looked a lot like Gray Gray and Wegner's uh, 2007 findings. We see a pattern similar to that found in uh, Powell's 2016 article participants rated the large charismatic animals as least acceptable to euthanize for population management purposes. The bat, the snake, and the tree were most acceptable. But then we looked at that relationship between mind perception and acceptability. And what we find using linear regression was that only the experience dimension was related negatively to acceptance of population management euthanasia. The agency um, capabilities did not factor in. Notably, this is controlling for the perceived intelligence of the animal. So regardless of intelligence, this is the pattern that we're seeing. So study one found that the acceptability of euthanizing animals was negatively associated with perceptions of the animal's capacity for experience. Study two, we sought to generalize these findings and try to replicate them with different, some different features of the studies. The animals in study two um, uh, consisted of seven different um, species with some level of conservation status. 420 people participated in the online study, and all participants in this case were residents of the UK. The survey of animal minds was developed uh, by us and a number of other studies um, to tap uh, these dimensions a little more thoroughly than the, more, um, the fewer capabilities we used in study one. This is a list of the different capabilities um, that we've um, developed uh, for the survey of animal mind. Participants also rated um, their impressions of the animal on six other um, characteristics. Finally, participants were again asked to rate how acceptable they thought it was to use population management euthanasia with that particular um, animal. And they rated that on a one to five scale. For those who are curious about the survey of animal mind factor structure, here are the results of an exploratory factor analysis of the 22 items and how they uh, mapped onto these different facets of mind perception. So we can think of these as sort of this constellation of 22 um, capabilities 
and they sort of cluster into these um, pretty regular pattern uh, of groupings. Although it's outside the scope of this talk, it's worth mentioning that the factor structure is very consistent across other studies we've conducted using samples from around the English-speaking world and um, using a variety of species. This time around, we examined how different dimensions of mind perception related to um, population management, euthanasia acceptability, while it's also controlling for other impressions we know from previous research are all also associated with moral concern given to animals. That includes intelligence, beauty, aggressiveness, endangered, uh, long lifespan, and how delicious it is to eat. Um, among these other impressions, we found that the beauty of an animal um, inversely um, correlates with uh, the acceptability of mind perception, which not terribly surprising perhaps for many of us. Aggressiveness though co co positively correlates as does the delicious to eat. So for the duck and the clam in particular, um, people perceiving them as being delicious to eat, uh, who perceive them as more delicious to eat, um, also found it more acceptable to, um, to euthanize the animal for population management purposes. On the other hand, when we look at these uh, three mind perception factors, we find once again, as in study one, experience, that capacity for experience negatively predicts that acceptability for the use of population management euthanasia. So the more capable the animal is of affective experience or perceived to be as capable of uh, affective experience, the less acceptable it is to euthanize the animal. Interestingly, that third foundational facet has the opposite effect. So we're seeing that the higher scores on the foundational capabilities tend to have a small amount of prediction positively for um, acceptability of population management euthanasia. So perceiving the capacity uh, for experience decreases acceptance for population management euthanasia. And importantly, how we measure mind perception also matters a lot. Public acceptance of conservation practices is guided by perceptions of animal minds. Mind perception is separate to the perception of intelligence and other impressions of animals. So it's not just that because more beautiful animals are perceived as having more mind or more intelligence animals are perceived as having richer minds, that these other factors explain the mind perception. Controlling for beauty, controlling for intelligence, we still see that these qualities of mind matter in people's judgments and moral, con moral concern judgments of animals. And more often, and, and, and very importantly, although don't touch on it too much here, but generic measures of mind perception probably muddle our understanding quite a bit of the time. And if we don't look at these different facets, we see that there can be suppression effects. Different facets of mind might have different relationships with different types of moral concern, as we see in study two, uh, where experience and fo these foundational capabilities work against each other. And for this reason, it's really important to be considerate of the uh, measures of mind perception we use and a little bit critical of other measures and their appropriateness uh, to the context um, of our use when we're looking at pe how people perceive non-human minds. Thank you for listening, and I'll look forward to further discussion during the panel. Great. Thanks very much for that, Michael. Terrific. So just a reminder to the audience, please post your questions in the chat. These will be this will go to the organizers, they will be going through the questions and they will then get posted through and can be, you know, I'll be posing them to the speakers in the panel discussion that's going to conclude this session. So please send them through as the talks um, go on and as you think of them. And you will also have a chance during the panel um, to send questions through as well. So our next speaker is Julie Fielder. Julie is a PhD candidate at the University of Melbourne. Um, Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural Sciences, and she works on the Future Horse Project, which investigates the attitudes of horse activity participants regarding horse welfare practices in racing, riding, sports, and tourism. So the first stage has a focus on what's currently working well, and the second stage develops a set of welfare statements saying, you know, what, what can we do better? The statements will help horses, horse carers, um, by informing welfare practices from on the ground through to policy. So that's the that's the project here and she's going to be speaking on that um, in this talk. So over to you, Julie. Hello, my name's Julie Fiedler. I'd like to welcome you to this talk on is there a role for anthropomorphism in veterinary practice and animal welfare science? Before going further, thank you to you four for arranging this workshop I'd also like to acknowledge my PhD supervisory team led by Professor Josh Slater, 
and Drs. Sarah Rosanowski and Margaret Eyre. I would also like to acknowledge and pay respect to the First Nations peoples of many countries and cultures whose spiritual connection with animals and country is of more than human meaningfulness, which may hold different values to Western cultures and westernised knowledge of sentience, agency and anthropomorphism, and the human and animal connection to each other and to country. Just a little about myself. I'm entering my third year of a PhD at the University of Melbourne about horse welfare. I'm also the secretary for a newer organisation concerned with progressing animal emergency incident management in Australia and New Zealand. In my talk today, I'll introduce the idea of horse welfare as a wicked situation before introducing anthropomorphism, which I'll now refer to as anthro. It's a bit of a tongue twister. The presentation then moved to some future horse project survey results before posing some questions for this workshop in the context of veterinary practice and animal welfare science. I've been thinking about horse welfare for quite a few years now. Welfare is a difficult topic because horse owners, veterinarians, scientists and the wider community have been working on welfare issues for years, yet problems persist. In developing potential solutions, it's important to join up different knowledge systems from science and society. Wicked situations invite us to look at old problems in new ways. Along with welfare, I've also been thinking about anthro for some time and wondering if it's a barrier or an overlooked opportunity to engage people in horse welfare messaging. In the next few slides, we'll firstly gain an overview of what is anthro. So later on, when it comes to the survey results, it will help with looking at what this might mean for welfare. Anthro is when people attribute human behaviours and characteristics to animals, nature or objects. Anthro is all around us every day. Just think of iPhone Siri or other technologies. In this project, we focus on horses, recognising that anthro is linked to interactions and that each person's experience is unique. For some people, anthro may lead to an increased sense of personal identity, a sense of control and predictability of their surroundings. It may also provide an increased sense of social connection and provide a way to relate to their horse and it may progress even to a sense of relationship and has links with empathy. Some people may also gain a sense that horses communicate their intent to do something. It may lead to some people attributing higher order reasoning and morality to horses, that is, the horse should be able to tell right from wrong. It may also lead in some people to a sense that the horse can watch, judge and form opinions about people and their actions. In others, anthro provides the motivation and justification for the treatment of horses, good or bad. There are many ways to talk about anthro. Let's look at different forms as outlined by author Lockwood which may resonate with many people watching this presentation today. The first is allegorical, when a person attributes human characteristics to a fictional character who often has a moral message to share. For example, Black Beauty raised awareness about animal welfare issues such as using the whip. Superficial anthro is attributing behaviours based on surface appearance. For example, saying the horse is drunk when a veterinary examination may explain something else. Some people may utilise explanatory anthro when describing a horse's behaviour, such as being lazy or naughty. Personification, Lockwood describes, is where people treat or think of animals in the same way as themselves. An example might be where media stories position racehorses as having ambition or feeling brave. Another is when humans feel cold and think their horse feels cold in exactly the same way. So we can see that anthro is all around us every day. 
You might even be able to think of a recent situation seen on TV or at the local stables. As scientists, we need ways of approaching anthro to help recognise it in others and in ourselves, and maybe to look at old problems in new ways. It's challenging because anthro is a politically charged topic in animal welfare, animal behaviour and veterinary science. But rather than brush it aside, let's include another option, critical anthro. Author Burgart argues that critical anthro helps to establish the ground rules for dealing with anthro tendencies that we as sentient human beings confront in trying to understand the behaviour of other species. This busy slide sets out an approach to thinking about animal welfare and anthro, which may be useful for scientists. The critical part refers to developing a cautious hypothesis or inference about an animal's mental state or emotions, which also may be predictive, and that references evidence-based knowledge. Importantly, it's an approach that requires scientists to be trained and experienced in reflective and reflexive practices. It also requires an understanding of the horse's behaviour in the relevant situation with knowledge about the horse that has been built up over time. One example where critical forms of anthro may be used is in quality of life assessments. Meller discusses critical anthro in his paper about welfare line sentience as an example of one scientist's approach to this topic, again with a reminder about its use with caution. There is a lot to digest on this slide. However, the references are listed at the end. This slide is an attempt at summarising the discussion about anthro so far. There are elements of anthro that may be useful for assessing animal welfare alongside evidence-based knowledge. The assessments could be point in time or predictive. The scale heads over to the right where it becomes less structured less evidence-based and the result may not be good for the horse at all. It's not in this project's scope to investigate anthro, but by gaining an awareness of the many forms, it helps with interpreting the survey results and when thinking about the barriers or opportunities to engage with people about horse welfare. We will now move on to looking at the Future Horse Project and the survey results. The project is investigating attitudes about horse welfare practices in racing, riding, sports and tourism. Conducted in two phases, the first phase ran a survey and asked people what they thought was currently working well for welfare. We also asked questions about sentience, agency, anthro and the social licence to operate. In the second phase, we will conduct a Delphi method and ask a panel to think about what can be done better for welfare. Today, We'll look at the results from the Phase 1 survey that relate to anthro. The online survey was open for nearly three months in 2021. The survey self-selection criteria included being an Australian or UK citizen, being involved in horse racing, riding, sports or tourism, to have three or more years experience in those areas, and in decision making about horse welfare, which could be undertaken as an individual or as part of a team. The results from 681 respondents found that 99% were from Australia, about 85% were female, and over half were more than 50 years of age. Most were involved in equestrian sports, followed by racing. Nearly half of respondents consider themselves professionals gaining some income from horses. When respondents were asked if anthro could influence horse welfare outcomes, nearly 83% of the 520 people who answered this question thought yes, it could. Respondents then told us how anthro related to welfare in their own words. The data underwent analysis with the result that the theme of anthro is good, bad, or good and bad for horse welfare. The following slides have example quotes addressing each component of this theme. Some respondents considered anthro was bad for horse welfare. For example, when people misinterpret horse behaviours 
that lead to poor decisions about writing or care. One respondent said, this, that's anthro, is the greatest disservice we can do for the horse or any animal is to label horses as naughty or dominant, etc. It then creates a behaviour in humans that can and it is usually detrimental to the horse. This example contains elements of explanatory form of anthro. In another example, this respondent said, by assuming that horses value the same thing as us, we're at risk of limiting their agency. The capacity for a horse to self-direct behaviours, exercise choice and take degrees of control regarding their surroundings are hallmarks of animal agency. The conditions for enabling or constraining animal agency are outlined in the five domains model of animal welfare. There's a link to this at the end of this presentation. Some respondents also thought there might be situations where anthro could be good for welfare. For example, opportunities to engage people in welfare messaging and potentially influence behaviour change. One respondent said, we need to take into account how people perceive or view horses and other companion animals to alter or influence the human's behaviour in correct welfare decisions, which can be made through the lens of anthro. Some respondents also thought anthro could be both good and bad for welfare. For example, when used in public forums such as committees or in media stories that influence a wider audience. One respondent said anthro can be a double-edged sword. People may be more aware of horses with emotions and being sentient, but the same attributes may also be misinterpreted, causing welfare harm. Another respondent said anthro is often used as a tool of persuasion when animal welfare is discussed at community level here too. The outcome for the animal is not always better or worse. Reflecting on these insights from the survey and information shared earlier in this presentation, let's now move to two scenarios that might trigger further discussion for this U4 workshop. The presentation now comes together with the U4 workshop theme of controversies and collaborations. We look at two scenarios where there may or may not be a role for critical forms of anthro. Suppose a veterinarian is holding an objective, fact-based conversation with an anthropomorphising horse owner about quality of life but the owner rejects the advice because they think the vet doesn't relate to their feelings about the horse's situation. And secondly, suppose an animal welfare researcher is undertaking a quality of life assessment. They are familiar with the horse's behaviours and are trained in reflexive practice. When, if at all, would there be times that elements of critical anthro could be utilised? We'll just do a quick wrap up. We first looked at the features of anthro and not all anthro is the same. We then found out about the survey results and how respondents thought about anthro and welfare from their perspective. We then looked at anthro and the U4 theme of controversies and collaborations. I'd like to finish up with thinking about future research. As society and science shift to greater acceptance of and knowledge about the subjective experiences of animals, is it time to revisit anthro and the wicked situation of horse welfare? As mentioned earlier, here is a list of today's references. And I'd like to wrap up with thanking everybody for taking the time to listen to this talk today. Awesome. Hi, Julie. Hello. Can you hear yeah. <laughs> hi, hi, Jordan. Hi. Hi. And hi, Michael. You're up.
it's one, it's wonderful to wonderful to see you all and thanks for such terrific talks now have you seen any of the questions you've seen some of the questions that have been posted in the chat already um obviously the people posting them in won't have seen um the questions that other people have posted so um what I will do is I will, I'll start by running through the questions and we have about um, sort of 17 minutes to get through this. And in asking the questions, I, th I think usually there's a the person who they should be directed to and I'll try to do that, but they are questions for you all to jump in on. So hopefully we can get a lot of, a lot of um, cross panelist dis discussion here, which would be great. Okay, so the first one's for you, Jordan. Uh, with the One Health, approach and the harms model is oh, so this is from Hannah Larson uh, with the one health approach and the harms model is cost associated with different types of harm considered when making decisions about animal animal control it seems that once a decision is made often the most cost effective method is chosen not the least harmful yeah um you want me to go ahead and answer that one or start it off Please, yes, go for it, and then others jump jump in. Um. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting question. It's a it's a long conversation, but I think the most important starting point is to make clear there's lots of different values associated with any of these wildlife situations. So, animal welfare is certainly one. It's a an increasingly important one. Historically, not so much, but probably higher in priority traditionally have been, you know economics, cost effectiveness, and what's even possible, and also biodiversity outcomes. So a lot of the wildlife management practices, the, the main bottom line that managers are worried about is our conservation outcomes, preventing species extinctions, eliminating uh, introductions, and the animal welfare has, has probably been secondary or even tertiary in, in a lot of cases. When it comes to actually applying the harms model, a really conceptual idea of, of welfare in these wildlife contexts, I think it's all been conceptual until now. I don't think anyone's really attempted to put together a weighted model that could tease out all the various harms, direct, indirect, unintentional, and try and, and put a quantitative um, spin on it because it's obviously very complicated. And then I think only recently we've we've really even been aware of a lot of these indirect impacts that might relate to water quality or pollution, or competition. So I think at this stage, you know, it's just a, a conceptual conversation. But yeah, it would be interesting in the future if we could try and put some numbers behind this or a bit more shape behind what's really just an idea at this stage. Yeah, that's terrific because it is it is. Um... Yeah, you know, it's it's sort of practical decision making has to has to happen at some point, doesn't it? And that's where it seems unavoidable to weigh a whole bunch of values, and that's something that um, uh, it's quite easy to talk in the abstract. That's what I do quite a bit of the time in in my work, and and I'm often very relieved because people at the coalface have to try and weigh these things up, and then a bunch of people can be critical of the decisions that they make and and all of that. So reaching consensus on how much weight you give different seems like an important thing. Um, Julie a, and, and yeah, Michael, do you have got a yeah. I've got a question for Jordan. Um, I'm just wondering about Indigenous knowledge systems versus and or with Westernised knowledge systems when it comes to uh, the topic that you're talking about. So how, how are you thinking about those two knowledge systems? Yeah, no, it's a good one as well and topical. I'm in New Zealand at the moment. I'm at a conference, another <laughs> conference, um, where we're discussing predator-free New Zealand a lot. And that's been, it's been really prominent. You know, I think a lot of wildlife management has moved beyond a you know, Eurocentric sort of approach. Um, and so particularly here, they've really made a big part of, um, of predator-free is making sure that all of the different Maori groups are, are on side with what's happening and priorities that are set, whether they're species that are valued and methods that are acceptable. Um, that's been, yeah, been pretty key. And I guess we're moving towards that situation in Australia as well. But I mean, the work that I presented there in the talk was really just the conceptual yeah. harms that animals might be faced with that arise from, from human action. So I haven't suggested any prioritisation there or, or any particular species or region. So there's probably nothing more I can really say about that. 
<laughs> Jordan, why limit to the harms that uh, that are anthropogenic? Why 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 not look at all the harms in nature? Yeah, that's the million dollar question, but it's um you know it goes right to the heart of of what life is because we know there's all this suffering that's inherent in, in natural selection and that's why we've achieved all the variation we have in life. So to, to think that we could or should remove some of those processes would get right at the heart of what ecosystems are. Their interactions between predators and prey and, and parasites and hosts. So beyond the question of could we do it, could we you know, prevent predation by fencing apart prey animals and predators, could we treat all animals with anti-parasitics? Would we want to? And what would be achieved? And would any potential gains in reduced suffering through those natural processes be offset by benefits? Would their lives be better if they were fenced into you know, cells where they weren't at risk of predation? And so I'm not gonna say it's intractable because there is a lot of momentum behind the idea of wild animal suffering and why it's important to think about the impacts of these natural processes on wild animals. Historically, certainly the, the main paradigm in wildlife management has been thinking about anthropogenic processes. And I would say that's true of nearly all animal welfare. Yeah, oh, great. Now, Michael, thanks for it. Thanks for your ter terrific talk as well. We've got a, a question here from Hannah Larson again. who says, uh, did you look at the natural social structure of the species um, and how that relates to uh, population management, euthanasia, or is it something that was linked to intelligence? Yeah, it, it, it's a great question, Hannah. And I think it's um, it's something that we ended up talking about because we were sort of um, kind of looking for everyday people's perspectives. Uh, there was some question as to sort of how much people actually put into that. And especially with, we, we tried to sort of stick with relatively unfamiliar animals. Um, so no, it doesn't. I mean, I think it's you could make a pretty plausible case that intelligence would be correlated with that kind of social structure, um, but we haven't sort of controlled for that. No, um, yeah. So I think that it, it's definitely the case when you talk, talk to zoo vets and and conservationists. This this does come up quite a bit, right? That social structure matters a lot. Um, but um, it wasn't something that we ended up asking um, our participants. No. So uh, I was thinking with your results, uh, you have a lot of, of, of correlations there, and I'm wondering whether you thought that these were, whether any of these showed causal relationships rather than merely correlative relationships. Sure, yeah, a another good question. Um, kind of devising the experiment for it wasn't um, immediately obvious to us, and I think I, I would I would make a case that, that um, it, the causal relationship goes both ways and there's other research that's shown that kind of moral concern for animals um can both you can you can drive kind of greater mind perception um or diminish it based on kind of priming use and 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 the opposite is true as well in other studies so i don't know that um i'd, I'd make a, a, a make case that can go both ways um i'm not as concerned about it with this although i think it's there's some actually i would say there's probably some other interesting causal work to do is really to sort of see what manipulating which kind of attributes kind of has more or less um, effect because I think one of the things we found in that first study especially was that um, it was really heavily relying on capacity for memory um, was was really predictive of, of acceptance and so to the extent you perceived it having kind of capacity for memory that was uh, bigger than anything which was fascinating to us I think that's one of the reasons you need a more thorough measure though too is to really kind of flesh out those facets because I think it was um, it's hard to say if that's unique to memory or not. But um, the causal question, yeah, is I think I, I would make a, I'd make a theoretical argument. It goes both ways. I have yet to kind of demonstrate that empirically with this uh, with the population management um, question in particular. Yeah, sure. I mean, because quite a bit of it looks like it like it could be motivated reasoning, really. You know, they taste good, so I'm thinking these ones are probably 100%. pretty stupid. <laughs> 100%. That's one of the reasons we stayed away. I, I've, I've been interested in just focusing on conservation animals is because I think it, there's a lot of other kind of um, impact. But again, um, Brock Bastian um, has, at University of Melbourne has done a lot of this work with meat eating and showed that motivated reasoning quite well in a lot of um, experimental studies already. And so I'd, I'd, I'd say that, you know, I, that, that's a pretty strong case that 
yeah, motivated reasoning be happening here? I just don't know. I'd be curious to find out sort of how much we do it with conservation species because I, most people probably don't give them much of a thought, but I think that the opportunity for that motivated reasoning is there and that might actually, in the right hands, kind of help some, you could imagine helping some conservation efforts, say. Hey? Yeah, that's Especially right. Especially for the less yeah. kind of um, less gregarious species. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right, now, um, Julie. Uh, I have a question that I think maybe for you from Sarah Babington. She says, um, does the perception or value placed on a species likely influence how useful anthropomorphism could be for conversations around animal welfare? Um, for example, thinking about companion versus versus farm animals. I think that's also perhaps for you to comment on as, as well, Michael. Yeah, but, I was going to say that's yeah. closer to Michael <laughs> um, rather than that. Um, focus for our project is really looking just a very rudimentary look at anthro so that I could process some of the survey results because the focus of um, the PhD is having a look at practices for welfare, what people do rather than um, assessing animal welfare. So, um, and there's been, because of that blockage or the contested space of uh, anthro at the word itself, I think, even more than anything, when it comes to animal welfare and, and animal behaviour scientists, there's very little work done in this space at all. I don't know, Michael, if you're aware of much work of linking anthro to behaviour change for animal welfare or any Look, I think psychology is quite full of it. In fact, I've, I've posted a question to you as well through yeah. the thing. But I, mean, I think it's it is a fascinating question because I think it, it is an individual difference, as you mentioned. Hey, yeah. and I think there's good measures sort of trying to flesh out. It depends what you mean by anthropomorphism. I think that That's conceptual right. clarity is always term. really trouble. <laughs> but but I think you know we have to have that conceptual clarity if we're going to do the research. Um, and um, I think there are a lot of yeah that the, the, there would be considerable like linkages um, in the existing literature. I was just kind of going through my the tarot kind of looking for various anthropomorphism kind of um, <laughs> psych studies. And it, and it does link into the welfare um, literature quite a bit. And, you know, but it is, as you say, it's about that being similarity, that motivated, you know, we're motivated for anthropomorphism to the extent that we feel that similarity, we feel that connection, right? And so to horses, it's not surprising. And as Jordan's talking about, you know, native species, we do it quite easily, but pests, boy, that, that pest label really, you know, drive yeah. a wedge between you and anthropomorphism. I mean, it was fascinating when I, I was in Australia before coming here and boy, that, you know, that, that those perceptions of opossums just, just you know, <laughs> snap your neck how quickly people kind of, you know, see them as, I remember taking a baby possum at nine o'clock at night to the vet school at University of Queensland, you know, because, oh, and then here, gosh, I mean, the, oh, well, Mike, you would have seen it too. It's just, yeah, it's fascinating. Um, it's, a sight, it's a sight to behold, yeah. And and, and it's, yeah. I, I, find, I find for myself how quickly I can um, fall in line with that kind of thing. If you're around people like that and over in, oh, in, in Australia, yeah. it's like, oh, yeah, they are really cute. Oh, look at them. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, I think, and so I think that's the hard thing, Julie, as you say, that, that it's, not, it's not a blanket. I mean, we have tendencies for anthropomorphism. Yeah. And of course, it's not just you know, non-human animals, it's robots and all sorts of stuff that yes, there are, we yeah. have these individual differences with. And I think if you don't tend to do it, it's really hard to imagine doing it. People, you know, some people just are, don't do it much at all. Um, and others of us do it quite willingly, but regardless of whether you do it or not, I think we got to confront it. And for me, that's yes. the psychological question is we can't deny the human factor in any of these decisions. We can be as clinical yes. as we want, but boy, like we're still like little, yeah, evolved meat bags, you know, making these decisions. Sorry, but and it's that's the that's the fascinating bit to me. I just get to come in and poke at things, and you guys can do the hard work. Julie, horses. Um, so th this is a, a sort of an idea um, from from uh, Mia Cobb. Uh, talks about the relationships that horses that people have with horses and how they vary quite a lot across a lot of different contexts. Yeah. You know, sort of companions, sort of, you know, in a work relationship, recreational, sporting, and all of that kind of thing. Um, do you, so you also see that anthropomorphizing varies a lot across across people. Um, and will you get into these different contexts and see how that might affect the way people anthropomorphize and how that relates to um, perhaps the welfare of animals in those contexts? Uh, I guess 
in this in this project it's it's one of 18 questions so it's uh just inform it's informing how we got how do we do practices that relate to horse welfare so some people may be informed by their anthropomorphic viewpoints um i guess i'm still coming back to that original question of of not uh, not using it as a blind spot. I think that time is going past again. As Michael said, we've got to confront it. We've got to look at it and say, well, where does it fit? And we just be aware that we're consciously stepping in or stepping out of using it. The conversation, I'm starting the conversation. Let's put it on. <laughs> um, so in the horse sector, because it's been suppressed for quite a number of years. I don't know how it goes in other animal sectors. Maybe Jordan or Michael might be more aware, but the horse sector, it's always been, you know, never. So uh, whether, whether it is more prevalent in companion animals, perhaps? Yeah. <laughs> Jordan. I tuned out for a second, I'm on it, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i do i do wonder a little bit how much we sort of um uh you know like we do we, we do a lot of thinky work and some I, you know, I i think all of your talks show that we're often thinking but we're also sort of you know um we're driven by our biology and all sorts of sort of neural processes that are, that are operating that make us feel all sorts of different ways and sometimes i sort of wonder how much um uh you know, room our reasoning has to actually affect what we yeah. do. And, and, you know. Yeah, I, I guess, yeah, sorry, I was going to say, I guess an, uh, um, moving away from horses, then an obvious one is with all the flooding going on and you've got people on the roof of the house with their dog uh, waiting to be rescued, um, but will not leave without their dog. Um, so, again, that's saving saving their dog and saving themselves so it's it's looking at putting a value onto that dog as well so how does that affect emergency services and the equipment they carry on on the helicopters or the training they receive as people have these changing expectations in society the animals will be with with them more rather than commodity on that Sorry, point yeah, could i just Callum had a question, and I think it fits well here too. Is there are these, you know, I think we, I think these are not just culturally different, but I mean, within cultures, there are huge individual differences as to kind of how our tendency to anthropomorphize. And it goes to those cultural values, you know, I mean, Jordan, sometimes it's a pest and sometimes it's not. But yeah. I think also culturally, you know, there's going to be those, those places where we just tend to value animals more or less and, and have relationships with different species. And so this is to me why I think understanding those individual differences, that we're not going to get sort of an understanding from some sort of global stamp there is appreciating that we're all coming at it from different places. And, yeah. you know, recognizing, I'm going to, Kat's trying to stop us, but we're going to keep talking. It's such <laughs> but, a good cat. I don't want to. I'm holding back. <laughs> but, and I think, but I think it's appreciating, you know, like you know, from Nagel's perspective, you know, we're not going to be able to get that perspective of their minds, but for the love of God, we can, you know, try to sort of find some objective ways of getting at, you know, some of these phenomenological experiences the animals have, but recognizing that, you know, we're never going to do that perfectly and we're still all, you know, humans and as humans, we're going to be doing this, you know, we're going to have theories of mind, we're just naturally predisposed to it. Yeah. And there are minds there, we just don't know what they are, but we're going to vary in those perceptions and that's fun. And I think that recognizing that is going to help us probably overcome this more than anything, right? I don't know. That's what I think. Thanks, so. <laughs> This is fun I to talk to people. Uh, great, great chat. Now, well, I mean, now I should obviously hand over to you here, here, Kat. But I would just like to say thank you very much for three wonderful talks, and I, and um, on behalf of the audience too, um, and thank you for all of your questions, audience. And I'm sorry for those of you whose questions we haven't got to. Maybe they can be assigned to people, and they can type in answers outside of the session. Is that right, Kat? I don't know. Uh, yeah, we can do that. Yep, sounds that good. Would be, that, would, that would be great, I think. Um, but so, wonderful, wonderful to hear your talks. Good luck with all of your great research. And um, if everyone you know, present at the Bioethics Centre here in Dunedin, uh, drop me a line. That'd be great. <laughs>
cheeky plug there mike thank you very much everyone great discussion i didn't want to end it i feel like the the mean mum come along to end the session um it was great listening to you all um but i know we do want to take a break so we're going to have a approximately 25 minute break just check the ske the schedule in your time zone when we start up, up again but thank you very much to Mike for chairing the session and to our awesome three speakers. It's been so good, a great discussion about how we can think about animals um, in different ways and what that might mean for their welfare. Um, so we'll see you back again in about 25 minutes. You might like to take the time to visit the U4 website and have a look at that. Um, and obviously take a break and refresh yourself and we'll begin again soon. Thanks everyone.